In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, this morning, we have a very serious theme. The theme is entitled, The Spiritual Peril of Denying the Truth of God. It is very rare that we have such a theme in our almanac. But this morning, the almanac draws attention to this important dimension of our relationship with God. If our relationship with God goes astray, there is spiritual peril. The Bible readings that we had, the first reading is from Jeremiah. And there Jeremiah is concerned with people who reject the word of God. And he uses the word that they stubbornly reject, stubbornly rejecting. And so Jeremiah gets upset and says, God lets judgment fall upon them. The second reading is the epistle reading from the Hebrews, and we will be looking at this subsequently. In the gospel reading, again, there is this conflict, Jesus on one hand, and the scribes and the Pharisees, and scribes and Pharisees condemning Jesus that you have got Beelzebul within you. You are coming from Satan. And then Jesus trying to make them realize that what they are saying is serious matter. And Jesus concludes by saying, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And so this morning, our focus is on the spiritual peril, the spiritual danger of denying the truth of God. And I would like us to do a kind of a Bible study. And this Bible study is focused on the epistle to the Hebrews. We usually do not look at Hebrews so seriously because it is largely addressed to Jewish people. And there's a lot of Jewish terminology, Jewish rites and rituals that are elaborated in that episode. And therefore, being part of the word of God, let us today look at one important teaching from the epistle to the Hebrews. And that important teaching is five warning passages in Hebrews. Five warning passages. Five passages that tell us about spiritual peril of denying the truth of God. The first passage is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You may refer it in your own Bibles, Hebrews 2, 1 to 3. This is what the word of God says. Therefore, we must pay the closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the message declared by the angels was valid and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord 
and it was attested to us by those who heard him. Now this passage, Hebrews 2, begins with the word, therefore. Now if the writer is saying, therefore, means the writer is referring to something that has been said in Hebrews chapter 1. And in Hebrews chapter 1, the writer is saying that God has spoken to us in our times through Jesus. And this Jesus is much superior to the prophets that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people were concerned with. This Jesus is superior to prophets. He is even superior to angels. So a person who is superior to prophets and angels, we have to listen to him. Therefore, there's that word comes in. Therefore, we must pay the closer attention to what we have heard. What we have heard from the Son of God, Jesus. Now in that passage, he says, if the message declared by angels was valid. Now you may wonder, what is this message declared by angels? What is actually being referred to is the commandments that were delivered by God to the people on Mount Sinai. Now we have all perhaps seen that film, Ten Commandments. We are in Sunday school always taught about the Ten Commandments. And it is said in Exodus chapter 19 that God delivered the commandments on Mount Sinai. But it's interesting. There was another tradition developing. Could God have been alone when God delivered I will read important sections of that verse. It says, the Lord came from Sinai. He came from the 10,000s of holy ones. Look at that. He came from the 10,000s of holy ones. At his right hand, there was a flashing lightning. At his right hand, there was a flashing lightning for them. This flashing lightning is referring to the presence of angels. Therefore, in the Septuagint, Septuagint is the Old Testament in the Greek language. In the Septuagint, if you read it, there is one more line added there. It says, on his right hand, were his angels with him. So in Deuteronomy 33 verse 2, on the right hand of God were his angels with him as the commandments, the law was delivered to the people. Similarly, Psalm 68 verse 17, there the psalmist writes, with mighty chariotry, twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. So, with mighty chariotry, twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands, what is this figure referring to? This figure is referring to the angels and God was with angels on Mount Sinai and from there God descends to the holy place to Zion. So there again you notice angels were there on Mount Sinai when God gave the commands. 
but a very specific reference comes in the New Testament. By then, the tradition had developed stronger. Therefore, we notice in the book of Acts, when Stephen was accused of blaspheming and uh, was tortured for spreading the gospel, then Stephen speaks to the people. And as he speaks to the people in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, Stephen is telling the people, you received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So very clear. You received the law as delivered by angels. He's telling the Jews, you got the law given by God on Mount Sinai. How was it given? It was given through the medium of angels. And so in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, what the writer is saying that if the message delivered by angels was valid and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, so if the law was given by God through the angels, and if you disobeyed it, you received God's retribution. So, in other words, penalties were imposed upon people for disobeying the word of God. You find that reference in Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. But the person who does anything with a high hand, and if you go further, it says, he reviles the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among his people. His iniquity shall be upon him. So Numbers 15, 30 to 31, they tell us, if anybody disobeys God's law, that person shall be cut off from his people and his iniquity, that sin, will be upon him. He will suffer the consequences of his disobedience. In that same chapter, Numbers 15, verses 32 to 36, there is an episode mentioned that while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Now, in the Ten Commandments, it was said, the Sabbath shall be kept holy. No work shall be done on that day. But this person was doing work, gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. So what happens? He has broken the law. Numbers 15, verse 36. All the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death. That was a serious penalty. Disobeying the word of the Lord, disobeying the law, deserved a terrible punishment. And here was a person being stoned to death. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, 21, you see Achan, Achan making a confession. God had told the people that when you fight your enemies, destroy them totally. Do not long for anything that belongs to the enemy. But Achan had disobeyed. In fighting against the enemy, he had been attracted to a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. So that is what is written in Je Joshua 7, 20 to 21. Achan says, I confess, I have disobeyed God. I was attracted to this wealth. And what did I do? I coveted it. I coveted that wealth. And so I took it with me and hid it under the ground inside my tent. So again, disobedience of God's law. What was the result? Joshua 7.25, he was stoned to death. 
So what is being said is every transgression of the law that was given by the angels received a just retribution. Now, there were occasions, as you are aware in the Old Testament, when God sometimes punished the Israelites directly from heaven. For instance, Korah and his fellow rebels, they rebelled against Moses. And you notice in Numbers chapter 16, it is said, the ground on which they were standing opened up and swallowed Korah and his fellow rebels, God's direct punishment. Similarly, in Numbers 16 verses 20, and uh, it's Numbers 16 verses the whole, I mean, whole section towards the end, plus Numbers 21 the whole, in that chapter, Numbers 25 in that chapter, you will notice there are verses which says, which say that God sent plagues among the people. God sending plagues among the people because they disobeyed God. So that first warning in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, it says, For if the message declared by angels was valid and every transgression received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Jesus, the Son of God, has spoken. Jesus, the Son of God, has made salvation available to us. But if we neglect, if we do not pay close attention to the words of Jesus and the work of Jesus, how shall we escape? Time and again, this happens to many of us. We say, I believe in Jesus as my savior. So I'm going to heaven. But I am not submitting to him as my Lord. I am not submitting to him as my Lord. I confess with my lips, but not from my heart. And so the writer to the Hebrews is saying, Either you are holding fast to your confession of faith in Christ and striving against sin, or you are drifting spiritually are in, and you are in danger of frightening judgment. Hebrews chapter 2, it says, we must pay the closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from God's word. So this is the danger, not paying attention. Christian community, a Christian individual, by lips, he professes or she professes to be Christian, but not paying attention to the word of God and the spirit of God in your life. So this is a danger. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, great danger in that, a peril. The second warning sign that you have is in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Very, very serious. Take care lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And in that same chapter, if you go further down, verses 16 to 19, who were these people to whom the 12th verse was addressed? Who were they that heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? And with whom was God provoked 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? 
And to whom did he swear that they should never enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see they were unable, these people, these people who had experienced the deliverance from Egypt, those who had experienced salvation under Moses, it is to these people that the word of God is saying, take care, lest you have an evil, unbelieving heart. With whom was God provoked for 40 years? The same Jews, as they traveled through the wilderness before they entered the promised land. So God who had traveled with them through all their struggles and hardships, this God they were rejecting. And therefore what is said, they shall not enter rest. This is that parallel that is given to us. If we do not believe in God's word and follow it, we shall not enter God's rest. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, there are two words. Unbelieving heart and disobedience. So unbelieving heart is disobedient. So these two are connected. And what happens with an unbelieving heart? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 17, 5 and 6. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. So cursed is the man who trusts in himself, who trusts in human capacities, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So a person who disbelieves God and therefore disobeys God. Spurgeon, the great preacher of earlier times, he says, as he preaches, it is not every church member who has a new heart and a right spirit. Judas was in the church, but he had an evil heart and was a devil. It may be so with me or my brother or with you. So Spurgeon is saying this word is to us as Christians. We are Christians in name, but we may not be of God. We have an evil heart. We are of the devil. It may be me, it may be my brother or sister, or it may be you. The same Israelites who had been rescued from Egypt were the ones with whom God was provoked for 40 years. And the reason for this provocation was that they sinned by abandoning trust in God. Numbers chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. There God's word says, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test and have not listened to my voice, shall see the land which I swore to their fathers, and none of those despised shall, who despised shall see it. So here God is telling Moses that all these people who saw the mighty works that I performed in Egypt to deliver them, all these people who saw how I brought them through the Red Sea, all these people who were fed with manna, with, with quails, were given water when they were thirsty, whose clothes and shoes and sandals did not deteriorate all those 40 years. What has happened? These people have put me to the test 
and have not listened to my voice. Because of that, they shall not see the promised land. So this is the peril of disobeying God. And you notice Paul makes reference to this. First Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 10 verses 1 to 5. This is what Paul says. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. These very people for whom God had sent Moses to Egypt, these very people for whom God had done everything. And as they came out of Egypt, what had happened? God's presence was there with them in the cloud. And then God's presence was there with them as they passed through the Red Sea. This is symbolic. Paul is saying what happened to the Hebrew people in Egypt is, has happened to us as passing through the sea implied baptism. So you who have received the sacrament of baptism, not only that, they ate the same spiritual food. The people in the wilderness, they ate manna, that thin wafer-like bread, and they had flesh, the quails, meat that they ate. We have the Eucharist participating in the body and blood of Christ. So these are God's people, but they disobeyed God. And therefore, they were overthrown in the wilderness. So what is the writer to the Hebrews saying? Spiritual peril of denying God in your life. There's a third warning. The third warning is in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. There, the writer says, for it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him to contempt. So imagine this. People who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the, whole, the word of God. All such people who have lived in fellowship with God, if they become apostates, they go against God, then there is spiritual peril. For example, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was called by Jesus and he traveled with Jesus for three years. He heard the words of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount and several other teachings. He saw the miracles of Jesus. Having seen all that, yet what happened, as we know, he rejected. He rejected the light that was there in Jesus, the truth that was in Jesus, what Jesus stood for. And he betrays Jesus and gets Jesus crucified. What was his end? Terrible. Another example, Simon Magnus. Reference is made to him in Acts chapter 8. Simon, Simon Magnus was from the city of Samaria. And Philip, the evangelist, goes and proclaims the gospel in Samaria. Many people listen to Philip 
and they believe and are baptized. What happens to Simon Magnus? Simon was a magician, okay? It says that in Acts chapter 8, verse 13, even Simon the magician himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So he accompanied Philip in his gospel ministry and the way Philip spoke and the works that were done through Philip, the signs and wonders, miracles, this all amazed, amazed Simon Magnus. When this was happening, reports went to Jerusalem that gospel is spreading in Samaria. Good response. So Peter and John visit Samaria. And then you notice in Acts chapter 8 verses 18 and 19. When Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of hands. That means when Peter was laying his hands on the people, they received the spirit of God. So what does Simon do? He offered Peter and John money saying, give me also this power that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Here was Simon going astray from God. Rather than seeking the presence of God, he was more focused on accumulating for himself the power of God. Acts chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, Peter said to him, your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Your heart is not right with God. Your heart is not right with God. This is what Peter tells Simon. And then in 8.22, Peter says to him, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. If possible, that intent of your heart, that innermost desire of your heart to get power. Remember Adam and Eve, Serpent says, if you eat the fruit, you will become like God. That desire for power, for self-glorification. If that intent of the heart, if it be forgiven, you will be lucky. You notice that this happens again and again. That, and this, word, this third warning is very strong. It says, impossible to restore people to repentance impossible to restore people to repentance. Even when they have seen everything of what Jesus has done for them in their lives and the glory of God and the works and purposes of God, if they stray away then, they cannot come back to God. Matthew chapter seven, verses 21 to 23. This is what, what is the spiritual peril of people who try to make a business out of their Christian faith for themselves. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Very strong. Christians and working for Christ performing many things in Christ's name, but they did not know Christ. And what is the judgment? Depart. A fourth warning. This comes in the text that we read this morning in our service. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 27. Look at those words very seriously. For if we sin deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire which shall consume the adversaries. Sinning deliberately or willfully, what does it mean? It is doing what one wants to do even when one knows that it is wrong. Doing what one wants to do even when one knows that it is wrong. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. This is what Paul says there. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify the desires. Make no provision for the flesh. So if you make provision for the flesh after knowing Christ, you are deliberately deliberately committing sin. Sin, it has its way of getting hold of you. James chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. James puts it very graphically. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The eyes see, the eyes desire, and you are carried away by your lust. That's the first step. Then in that passage it says, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So lust leads you to rebel against God's way of life. It leads you to sin. And then in that same passage, James says, and when sin is accomplished, it brings death. So the lust of the eyes, they make us commit sin. And when sin is accomplished, when sin becomes the very core of your life, it brings death, spiritual death. So the perils of turning away from God. Phil Newton, a great preacher of his times and a scholar, he preached a sermon on the peril of playing Christian. What he means is, he says, this happens to some of us. We grew up in a church with Christian parents, hearing the gospel on a regular basis. We profess to be Christian at some point in our early years and gave outward appearance of being serious about our Christian faith. But the day came when we were challenged about the gospel. And rather than believing God, we embraced a lie, the lies of the world. Not repenting of such sin, we continued to grow cold toward any thought of divine truth. We gave ourselves to sin, indulging our desires without restraint and maybe laughing at the thought of the law of God. Years pass, our hearts get harder. We can still rattle the basic elements of biblical truth, but it means nothing to us in our life. And then he gives a very strong example. We become like pigs. Pigs who after they have been given a good bath, rush to the muck and wallow in the mud. 
sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth. Charles Templeton was a great man in the first part of the 20th century. In 1936, he accepted Christ in his life. In 1941, he established a church in Toronto. In 1945, he got together a gathering of church leaders, including the young Billy Graham, and they founded Youth for Christ. During the 1950s, Templeton started preaching all over the world. He preached in 14 countries. That is the 1950s, mind you. But then, towards the end of the 1950s, he writes, after a long time of introspection, I publicly declare myself to be agnostic. Agnostic means one who is not sure whether God exists or not. That happened to this great man who founded a church, who was responsible partly for founding Youth for Christ, a great evangelist who traveled to 14 countries, they becomes agnostic. And finally, in 1986, he published his memoir and the title of his memoir was Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. Now, a person who has experienced the the light of the gospel, who was born anew in Christ, who became a pastor, who became an evangelist, who did wonders. And when such a person goes astray from God, it's difficult for that person to repent. And then as that reading in Hebrews chapter 10, which we were looking at the subsequent verses, they say no offering. No offering will suffice for covering up your sins. No offering. Now the Jewish people knew in the book of Leviticus, there were several offerings. The burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the peace offering. But when you have deliberately rejected Christ, there is no offering that can cover up for your sinfulness. The fifth warning, that is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. Do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not refuse the God in Christ who is speaking to you from heaven. And then example given, or if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. Now, what does this mean again? It refers to the Jews. Refusing means to turn away, to turn away from God. Hebrews 30 to 15, it is said, or if you turn away from following him, he will once again abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all these people. This is what God says to Moses. If you turn away from following him, he will once again abandon you in the wilderness and you will be destroyed. Then Deuteronomy 30 verses 17 to 18. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you this day you shall perish. If you turn away from God and seek other gods, whether it's money, whether it's uh, fame, or whatever you desire, if you turn away from God, that day you shall perish. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 19 and 20. But if you turn away, and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, 
and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land which I have given you. Now this God is speaking to the people when they were already in the promised land. If you disobey, I will uproot you from the land which I have given you. And the house which I have consecrated my name, in my name, I shall cast out of my sight the temple. The temple which has been consecrated in my name, I will finish it off. I will destroy it if you turn away. And this is what happened. Nebuchadnezzar's army came and destroyed Jerusalem. And then that verse, that passage in 2 Chronicles then, Isaiah says, I, I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Proverb that those Jews, the people of God, don't become like them. Jews would become a proverb. The temple reduced to dust. The dwelling place of God reduced to dust. This would become a saying in our languages. So this is what is being warned, the fifth warning, Hebrews 12, 25. And this is that warning that you find in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 12 to 15. Book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 12 to 15. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them. And all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Remember, we started our worship with that opening verse which said, God is a consuming fire. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Five warnings from the book, from the epistle to the Hebrews about the spiritual peril of denying God. In the 18th century, there were powerful preachers and one of them was Jonathan Edward. Jonathan Edward preached a sermon which was partly responsible for the great awakening that happened in America in the 18th century. And the sermon was entitled, Sinners in the hand of an, Hands of an Angry God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, Jonathan was a very quiet, composed speaker. He did not raise his voice so much. He spoke, but his words were strong and deep. And it is said, when the people heard the sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God, while he was preaching, people in the congregation started weeping and wailing. And then there had to be some counselors who went and sat with them because they were convicted of their sinfulness and they feared that if they fall into the hands of God, it would be terrible. And that led to the great awakening. Yes, we are living in the 21st century and we are getting carried away by this world with all its attractions. Yesterday we celebrated Indian Christian Day. The church in India needs to repent. There has to be a coming back to God. 
we have to turn over our lives lest we face the spiritual peril of nominal Christianity. Amen.